Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, what a joy and privilege it is for us to worship together today, to come together knowing that the Spirit of the Lord has given us faith. As we do uh, come together, we know that promise that He has shown us through Jesus Christ our Savior, that one day we shall be with Him forever. May this fill your hearts with the hope and the joy and the peace that you are God's children. Amen. Please bow your heads with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for sending forth your Holy Spirit, that he has granted us the faith to trust and believe in you. We thank you that he works to nurture our faith each and every day. We thank you that we have the hope and promise that one day we shall rest secure with you. May this hope fill our hearts now and always. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The best things in life come in small packages. Or maybe you've heard it, the good things in life come in small packages. Well, my father-in-law learned that the hard way. My mother-in-law still tells of Christmas 1993 and the infamous bread maker. Christmas 1993, my mother-in-law had just gone back to school. She was working a nine-to-five job. She had two children who she had to shuffle around and shuttle everywhere who played sports. And my father-in-law looked at her schedule and he said to himself, the loving father-in-law that he is, She needs a hobby. So he got her a bread maker for Christmas. My mother-in-law opened that bread maker, and she still talks about it. I'll let you decide whether or not it's the thought that counts or not. But let me tell you one thing about that bread maker. It was only used two times before it left their house, and the two times it was used was not by my mother-in-law. Now I tell you that to contrast with Christmas of 2004. My father-in-law, he is a metal detector, an avid metal detector. Some of you go to the beach to go swimming to lay in the sun. Not him. He goes to dig and find treasure. Most of the time he doesn't. Maybe a beer bottle, beer can here or there, but usually not much. Well, summer of 2004, he found this beautiful ruby ring. He got it cleaned up, got it sized, and gave it to my mother-in-law. Christmas of 2004, He got her a matching ruby necklace. I guess good things do come in small packages. She still talks about that Christmas as well. Now, I guess the advice I have for you gentlemen is, unless your wife asks for an appliance, do not give her one for a hobby for Christmas. But more importantly, more importantly, as we think about good things that come in small packages, I think as we we do think on that, it's so counterintuitive for us. As we live in this world that talks about bigger is better, the tallest buildings, the fastest roller coasters, who has the largest house, the fastest car, whose golf swing can can drive the ball the furthest, who's got the biggest bank account, all these types of things, we measure things by their worth, their size. And the larger it is, it must mean the more it's worth. But that's not always true, is it? That's not always the case. As we think about things that are small, that are worthwhile, I ask you first to think about salt. A grain of salt. Now this is imperative for our lives. Indispensable. You can't have life without salt. In fact, in the early, in the early days, they would talk about the trade routes, and they would be called the salt routes because of how important salt was. They couldn't just go to Vons, pick up a salt shaker off for 99 cents off the shelf. Salt was important, but yet it's tiny. Jesus himself said, salt, you are the salt of the earth. How important it is that we sow those seeds of faith, planting those seeds that the, and letting the Spirit grow that faith. But that's not the only place that a small thing is mentioned as important. I don't know if you often get into the book of Proverbs, but in Proverbs chapter 30, it's a sec- section of Proverbs that's not written by Solomon, but actually written by uh, Agur, son of Jakah. And if you can, guys can spell that, that's a test for the confirmands. Uh, then, uh, no. Just kidding. But I do want to share with you, right near the end of that Proverbs 30, four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Rock badgers are creatures of little power, yet they make their homes in the crags. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. A lizard can be caught with the hands, yet is found in king's palaces. The book of wisdom talks about how important small things are. Small things. And even in our world today, 
small things are important. An ounce of gold is worth a great deal. And yet it's none of us really can imagine how small that is unless we work with it regularly. A diamond has great value, not just financially, but if any of you have ever worked with a diamond drill, blade, the drill bit or a, a saw blade with that is diamond studded saw blade, you know how you need that for cutting certain things like concrete. Or even think about conception. The size smaller than a grain of salt. When the sperm and the egg come together, a child is formed. And, what, and uh, we can't even put a worth on that child that is forming in the womb. Many of you are parents. Could you put a worth on your child? I don't think so. Small things. All these small things lead us to think about that small bit of faith God talked about in our reading for this morning. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus said of faith, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Matthew 17, 20. You think about that, and you think about a mustard seed, and I, I want you to grab your bulletins for just a minute, and I want you to find a period. Now, I know it's going to be difficult for you to do that, but so often in our Western thinking, we imagine that, uh, th that a mustard seed must be about a one millimeter or two millimeters, still quite small. But even smaller than that is the period. And, smaller, and that is about the size that Jesus is talking about of mustard seed in the Bible. Now, I know many of you can't even hardly see that, but when you think about that, that's an awful small amount of faith, isn't it? An awful small amount of faith that can move mountains. An awful small amount of faith that can change the world, that can change lives for Christ. And Jesus said, truly, if you have faith like that, you can move mountains. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that verse, or its brother in Luke chapter 17, which talks about at least maybe a little smaller thing, moving a mulberry tree with that same amount of faith, I feel a little bit of guilt. I don't know about you, but when I read that verse, I know there are times where my faith is not that strong. Now here's the test for today. Have any of you moved any mountains lately? Have any of you even asked a mulberry tree to move and it picked up roots and jumped over there from here to there? Anybody? How about a pebble? Silence. I kind of thought that might be the case. And when we look at that verse, and we think about faith needing to be that small, we feel guilty. We feel guilty because we, we think about how little our faith must be. And we make this verse all about ourselves. We maybe sometimes try to justify ourselves. I've heard preachers go on and on about the size that the mustard seed actually was. You can spend a good hour talking about the history of a mustard seed, believe it or not. But that doesn't get to the point, does it? I've heard preachers talk about the sovereignty of God. Maybe it's just God's will that that mountain not move, that that mulberry tree stay put. God is, after all, sovereign. Okay, well, that's a fair, at least it's an answer. But it doesn't get to the point, does it? I've heard other preachers who say, well, they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. Here we are celebrating Pentecost Sunday. So therefore, therefore, the Holy Spirit must not have been with them yet. But then we have to disregard the entire Old Testament, don't we? Because how many times in the Old Testament does it talk about the Spirit of the Lord and the amazing things the Spirit of the Lord did among the people of God? The problem is, is we don't want to look at that verse in the law that it's meant to show us. The microscope of God's law pierces right to our hearts. And we see that it says that no matter what we do, no matter how great our faith, it is still small. It is tiny, and let's face it, it stinks. And we don't like to think about that. We don't like to hear that. We like to talk about the fact that, well, we have pretty good church attendance. We're in church fairly regularly. I went through two years of confirmation, uh, putting up with pastors for an hour each night, and sometimes longer. We like to think to ourselves that, well, I'm faithful in God's word, or I regularly pray. 
I read my devotions. I say the Lord's Prayer before I go to bed. And so we make all these excuses so we can avoid the, God, the microscope of God's law, which shows us that truth, that our faith is weak, smaller than a mustard seed, a pebble. But you notice our guilt, my faith. Who's the center of that? Me. You know, truly, I think our pride gets in the way when we look at this verse. You know, so often we, we know that we're supposed to look at Scripture in the whole breath and body of God's Word, but our pride causes us to focus in on that verse and forget that there are other verses of Scripture, other verses of Scripture that tell us that God sent His forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. But we don't hear that when all we can think about is our own, our own faith, our, what it is. And that's why it's important we know the rest of Scripture. Because when we look at the rest of Scripture, we realize it is not about our faith. It is not about our commitment. It is not about our promises. But it is about Jesus. Because Jesus came to redeem each of us who are under the law. Jesus came to this world and showed undying faith to the Lord. Jesus came to this world knowing the punishment that He would face on the cross. And He said, not my will, but Thy will. Thy will. Jesus said that for you and for me. And we receive that gift of faith. That promise. Not in the acceptance we make. But long before many of you can remember. For some of you, you might remember it. But for many of you, I suppose you don't. Because maybe you couldn't even hold your head up on, on, your, on its own. But as the waters of holy baptism washed over your face. As the pastor said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those words and that water, as we are promised, brought faith. The Lord wrote His name upon your heart and claimed you as His very own. The Spirit created faith in you. Long before you can remember, the Spirit was working on your heart and your life before you could assent to it, knowing that, he, that you were His own. And that is truly Truly, how we know that our faith is not merely the faith of a mustard seed, but the faith of God working through us. That is how we know that even it, when our faith is weak, God can do magnificent things, just like He could move mountains, change heaven and earth to save our lives by His death on the cross. He can use the simple things in our heart, in our lives, to move heaven and earth, to move mountains. So often, we read about the heroes of Scripture, we read about those great Old Testament heroes and their great faith. But let's look at them for just a minute. Let's look at Abraham. Abraham, God chose him. God called this, this man who was worshiping after false idols. And God chose him. Planted faith in his heart. Led him to be the father of a great nation. How about David? David doesn't have a very good reputation, does he? He was known for his adulterous behavior with Bathsheba. Isn't that what most people remember from the Bible? Uh, and the Psalms, of course. But God said to David, first, I forgive you. Second, I will make you a great household of faith. And through David's line, he brought his son. Or Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah. I pity Jeremiah. But I think that Jeremiah, he had a tough road ahead of him. When God called Jeremiah, he had to come to the people of God and he had to preach the law. Not only to the people, but to the king. And the king, when he heard it, he wanted Jeremiah to die. On the other hand, he had the command of God. And who can go against the command of God? He was stuck between a rock and a hard place, but he preached the word faithfully. He walked in the steps that God intended for him. Faith. Faith as small as a mustard seed. And God changed hearts and lives through his preaching. And today... God changes hearts and lives through you, through you, His people. And He does it in small ways. He does it in ways that maybe sometimes we miss. He changes lives. Maybe, maybe sometimes when you say to that clerk at Vons, God bless you, have a good day. You don't know how God might use those words to bless her day, to bless His day. 
Or what about just making that phone call to a friend who's not feeling well? Asking a friend out for lunch. Taking a few minutes to show someone you care. Those things are small things. Seemingly unimportant. And yet God can do amazing things through them. God uses the small, what we would call insignificant, to change lives and to change the world. Today, we're going to celebrate the faith that God blessed Joe and Ethan with. We're going to celebrate the fact that God, in, in their baptisms, called them as his very own. The fact that he planted that seed of faith in them. And now as we celebrate with them, we celebrate the way that he has nurtured that faith. The way that he has walked with them. The way that he has been their guide throughout their lives. The what promise that they make before us. And the promise that we have is that he will walk with them each of their days. And that's the promise he makes to each of us. Is that when our faith is small, when our faith is weak, when we feel like they're, that we are so far from God, that he continues to pursue us. He continues to move through us and work through us. And he reminds us he is in control of all things. He gives us a promise that as he has come to redeem those under the law, that someday he is coming to redeem this entire creation, to call us from this world to be with him in his glorious life eternal. He will move heaven and earth that you might be with him forever. May this be your hope this day and every day. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that in every day, every way, you are faithful to us. That even in the, li the things we face in, the face in this life, we know that you are there. Lord, reassure us always of your holy promises, the way that you move and work in this world. Help us to see the way that your will is being done, even if at times we do not recognize it. Lord, we especially this day pray that as Joe and Ethan make these confessions of faith before us, that they would know that you are with them always, that you are their guide, that you have given them the promise that one day they shall rest secure with you. May you bless them and may you bless each of us with faith that draws closer to you and hope that one day we will rest in your beloved arms. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.